Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this episode of Life's a Breach. It is Data Privacy Day or Data Protection Day, and that is what we are going to dive into today. We are going to talk about digital privacy or data privacy, what that means to you, how your organizations are going to react, uh, how you need to keep that in mind. Now, you may be thinking, why is a cloud security, a cybersecurity company talking about this? That is one of the things we are going to dive into with my two guests. Uh, joining me uh, today is Simon Nixon. He's the uh, Privacy and Compliance Lead here at Lacework. Simon, thanks for joining us. Most welcome. Glad to be here. And on this. Obviously, you know, celebrating this particular day. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be a fantastic conversation. And uh, joining Simon is Peter Garris. He's the Lead Security and Trust Engineer here at Lacework. Peter, thanks for jumping on. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So uh, you, hopefully everybody knows that it's Data Protection Day or Data Privacy Day. Um, if not, it is. Um, we've been doing this uh, for a few years now. Um, the idea is really, it's expanded from just the EU to a truly global day where we try to raise awareness around digital privacy, where we look at uh, the areas where we've had wins, which has been great that we're actually seeing those wins come in. And we look at areas where we need to maybe make more efforts in the year to come. Our goal today on the stream is to have a discussion around uh, what digital pr privacy really means, especially for an organization, how that balances out with cybersecurity. Now, it's not just us talking about this linkage. I read a great article this morning from Brie Fowler uh, published on CNET um, addressing a wider audience, sort of the broad public. And the amazing thing was it was phrased around um, data privacy and how you can increase your data privacy. And then all of the actions that Brie recommended were all sort of standard cybersecurity 101. So strong passwords, moving to pass phrases, using multi-factor authentication, keeping all your systems and your devices up to date. That's standard cybersecurity device and it's, uh, advice and it's great advice and it will help you increase your uh, data privacy. But it was just, I found it remarkable that, you know, we're sitting here talking about data privacy and one of the first actions that you can take sits in the security world. And for me, that's really a highlight of the linkage between the two, um, which is why we have uh, Peter and Simon here. Within Lacework, we've got Simon focusing on uh, privacy and compliance. We've got Peter focusing on the security side, building trust and building security into all of our systems. So I think it's going to be an absolutely fantastic conversation. Um, and I want to kick it off with Simon. Simon, um, there's been a ton of change uh, over the past few years. Uh, we've seen you know, the move into the cloud, how that's changing technology and, and how people build systems. But I think this story starts a lot earlier than that. And maybe we can get your perspective on how privacy has changed over the last few years or even decades. And, and maybe if you can kind of chunk it up into, into sort of eras, just to mm -hmm. make you know, follow that narrative a little bit. Well, from where you're sitting, what have you seen those changes? Okay, so let's let's start with pre-cloud. Um, so I would argue that data privacy, you know, really didn't have a seat at the dinner table for most organizations. It wasn't considered a business priority, no allocated budget. Privacy matters were kind of thrown over the wall to somebody from legal or HR to basically perform with their day job. Um, and, you know, additionally, a lot of organizations didn't even know about their obligations to, to comply. Um, and those that did kind of just ignored the fact because there was really no true enforcement around at that time. And then if we move into the era of what I call, you know, cloud, the cloud era pre GDPR. Um, okay. So what we have here is, is a, a you know, um, a bunch of, of providers spinning up new services in the cloud. Consumers are, you know, signing up to the new shiny thing they're they're providing their pii winningly because they trust the vendor um and then boom it becomes apparent during that period that some of these organizations aren't actually you know being very ethical about the use of that pii they're using it for different means they may be sharing it with each other or even selling it um causing a problem um i, I guess the you know the privacy commun community woke up at this stage and realized that you know, the existing data protection and privacy laws weren't really kind of adequate for this, this change in the technical landscape. Um, and with that as well, um, you know, we with the cloud, obviously, the, the movement of, of PII and data was moving freely across the, the globe in this, in a, what I would term a borderless world. 
and then we come um you know out of the sky what happens okay so um you know the clouds open the sun comes out down comes from the clouds this this new thing called the gdpr and the world of privacy is safe forever um and you know as with every classic fairy tale we, we all live happily ever after or not that's the case with <laughs> Okay. And okay, then, you know, uh, if I were then to talk about the world post GDPR, I mean, clearly, like the, the, the GDPR is, is really the first data protection privacy regulation that's got teeth, right? Um, you know, it's it set out, um, and I'd say, you know, if you look back at, at what it was, its intention was, I think it's been partially successful, right? It's been successful in, in, you know, building awareness for the individual to understand, you know, um, their rights around the use of their personal information. Um, and obviously it's built awareness to organizations for the, you know, around their obligations to be compliant with these data protection privacy laws. So that's been, I, I think has been a, a, a market su success. Um, and then additionally, one could argue that, you know, the, the ease of doing business within the EU um, has been improved too because they've removed a lot of the red tape um but you know with the shrems 2 decision that occurred in 2020 um and obviously you know that destroyed the, the eu us privacy shield framework as a means for transferring data out of the eu to the us um i'd argue that that's actually caused um kind of like a burden to to the act of doing business between you know um, america and the eu um with the so now you have to go through the process of, of you know, adopting SCCs and using data transfer impact assessments, which I can tell you, it's like pulling teeth, actually completing one of those. So I've recently done one. And so I, I, I can tell you firsthand. So um, additionally, I guess, you know, so I think that's the intention of the GDPR. And I think it's been partially successful. Um, what, what else has happened really well? There's been a lot of media coverage that's helped. Um, the fines are coming, you know, so, I mean, uh, for, for the GDPR, um, largest fine today is, uh, you know, $850 million. It's a pretty sizable amount of money. Um, but it's not just about the, the big tech giants who are being, you know, being um, fined here. It's also, what's interesting to me is that um, the abuse of the PII is occurring in every vertical, uh, in private, public sector, and even in not-for-profit. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. No one's really exempt from this, this particular space. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. So for those of you uh, who are watching who aren't uh, intimately familiar with it, um, so GDPR obviously is the uh, general data uh, protection regulation in the EU, and it applies to EU citizens regardless of where, where the system they're interacting uh, is. So if you're a Canadian company or American company and you're using uh, EU citizen data, it applies to you. And I think Simon's point about the, the big teeth is really the, the sort of why it's been such a revolution for data privacy is that the fines are significant. They're based on global turnover, not set um, amounts. Uh, and that is a really uh, a big thing. And that's something we actually lack here in Canada. I'm based in Canada. You probably tell from the accent. Um, we have great privacy legislation. It doesn't have enough teeth because the fines are set. So after a certain point, businesses are like, yeah, okay, you know, it, the economics don't work the same way. Um, but I want to pull Peter in here because something you said really, or the, not even everything you said was very interesting, Simon, but what really jumped out at me was the way you broke it up. So pre-cloud, cloud totally makes sense from a number of reasons. That's a massive shift in how we do IT, right? Having a data center versus, you know, on-demand utility computing, very, very different. But making that second distinction between we're in the cloud, pre-GDPR, and then post-GDPR, now we're talking about a legislative and sort of a cultural shift, even with the same technologies in place. Peter, do you see that same kind of breakup? And do you think, you know, what, what do you think pre-cloud, pre-GDPR cloud, pre versus post GDPR cloud? Did that change how people were using the technologies at all? I don't know if it necessarily changed how we're using the technologies. I think it sort of brought security more to the forefront. Um, you know, we've talked for decades about best practices for securing data in the cloud. Um, but, you know, GDPR really started to force companies to take a, 
a bigger interest in it rather than just, you know, somewhat ignoring their security teams. It, you know, now becomes something that poses a, you know, potential high risk to a company if they are not taking adequate security measures, which is, you know, a key requirement of the GDPR. Um, we've had regulations that, you know, are designed to protect data um, for decades, but with GDPR, it's the first time I think there's been a regulation that really applied more broadly than say, PCI to credit card information or, you know, in the U.S. HIPAA for healthcare data. Every company deals with PII in some way, shape or form, whether or not it's just the PII of their employees, their customers, or, you know, in a B2C arena, you know, the data of all of their, you know, their individual customers. So, you know, I think it, GDPR really has brought it all to the forefront. And I think that's actually been a great win from GDPR. Yeah. And I mean, that, that, those size of those fines, so that, you know, um, I think it's 4% if you've messed up the notification and the handling, and then an extra potential 2% if you've been negligent in your security um, is a massive, like that's a board level conversation, right? That's not just a, someone down, a director can accept that risk. That needs to be a top level business discussion, which is not just a win for privacy, but a win for security as well, because it's, it's a direct uh, linkage as opposed to just, you know, being the crazy people in the tinfoil hats screaming about these issues. Now it's, it's literally, you know, on the line for, for the business. Um, but that leads into, into my next question. And, and I'll start with you on this one, Peter, um, was it, you know, in, in the intro here, I said that privacy and cybersecurity are linked and maybe I'm overstepping because for me, that that's a, a fundamental uh, belief is that you can't have one without the other. Um, but do you agree that you need strong cybersecurity uh, to deliver privacy, uh, Peter? What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, wholeheartedly. You know, I think PII at the end of the day is just data and companies, you know, are really need to do a better job of protecting their data, regardless of what it is. Uh, one of the key components of that is knowing what data you have. You know, again, another requirement of GDPR and other privacy laws. And so, you know, that forcing function to make companies understand what data they are collecting, what data they're processing, how they're storing it, where it is, you know, what third parties they're transferring or sharing it to. That's been a key thing because only then can you look at those data flows and start to apply security controls around them. You can't protect data that you don't know you have, and you, know, you can't secure data that you're ignoring, if you will. I think that that's the clippable quote right there, right? You can't protect what you don't know um, that, that you have. And I think that that's something we've been struggling with in cybersecurity for a long time is understanding what we're actually protecting down to a specific level. And I agree, I think GDPR is that forcing function of, you need to know what information you have about Mark and what you have about Simon and Peter in your system, because it's our right, or at least it's Simon right, Simon's right under GDPR to turn around and request that, right? And say, what do you know about me? And I, I need to know, and there's a process for that. And that forcing function has been great with a big stick to, to make it happen. Um, so le while yeah. we're still talking about this, um, Simon, we're four years into GDPR, a couple into active fines, and we've seen, you mentioned one of the big ones there, and we've seen a number of pretty sizable fines. Um, the CCPA or the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act is in full effect now as well, um, and that's starting to change how the U.S. deals with and sees privacy, because trying to figure out where in the U.S. a customer is without explicitly asking them and then segmenting your system off to deal with Californians in a different way than the rest of the U.S. is, is always a challenge. Um, but do you see... With that, um, you know, what trends have you seen alongside uh, these big legislative movements, um, you know, either on, on the culture side, on the legislation side, just in general, what are you seeing the movement? What is what is becoming? Yeah, I mean, so, um, you know, thank you, California, for coming online um, and leading the charge. Obviously, a number of the other states in America are following suit. They're spinning up their own data privacy um, laws, which is fantastic. But I guess the um, the big the 24 carat question is really around you know when is america going to finally get a federal privacy law because they need it right um you know, we need it i think the globe needs it in order to aid you know a take um, you know the states off of the you know naughty step in terms of adequacy um it's going to help um improve the whole process of, of trade um and you know the trust between different geos and america so if anyone from the biden administration is listening um please make it so uh, it's on my christmas list um and it'll make everyone's life a lot happier right um so that that's definitely um a requirement um you know globally um 
what we're seeing, you know, based upon if I get if I just harp back to the GDPR for a second, is a lot of. I mean, let's be clear: the the GDPR is definitely con considered to be like the poster child of data protection regulations. Um, and what I'm seeing is, you know, other jurisdictions are basically cherry picking some of the elements of the GDPR and adding it to their existing data protection law, which is fantastic. So they're hardening their your jurisdictional laws which is obviously um forcing the issue around you know adoption of good data pri privacy practices which i think is fantastic the other thing that's kind of interesting is really um if you hark back over the, the eras here is that data privacy um as a market was almost like a cottage industry back in the day right it was it was very special it's very niche um it's now transformed into a multi-billion dollar business right for technology and for consulting services so you know we have you know multiple multiple people going through certifications to get qualified in data privacy um you have um you know uh, the tech coming into into play which allows and, and i'm a big fan of this personally which is like leveraging automation to actually achieve your compliance right because the problem with the data privacy landscape is it, it changes on a daily weekly basis it's very difficult to keep abreast of it right so um big fan of automation you know look out go, go look for some of the tech that's out there that can help you achieve your compliance goals yeah great points and two two things there a if someone from the biden administration is is listening fantastic drop a question in the comments um and for the rest of you who are listening to the live stream here on linkedin feel free to drop a question in the comments uh we love that interaction we'll pull it in and we'll, we'll add that to this the discussion because the one thing that's challenging uh around privacy is that it is very community-based what people feel is private and what isn't and the eu with the you know gdpr that's been a big enough economic player that it's pushed that view out broadly um and yeah we see that as a there's actually a long history of jurisdictions sort of seeing you know looking over the fence and going okay you pass this really strict one how what's working what's not working let's you know add and improve to ours and then vice versa which given how long legislation takes to pass i think that's a really good model um, because then you get these multiple experiments and we're in that here in canada and another round based on the four years of GDPR, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and then, and then trying to upgrade that. Um, but you did mention a, a couple things around the technology, and, and let's get Peter back active here. Um, on the engineering side of things, with this legislation in place, with the fact that it's a board level conversation, and people need to meet these requirements, what sort of changes have you seen on the engineering side, uh, based in your experience, Peter? Yeah, so I think, you know, Along with security by design, we're also seeing, you know, an effort to do privacy by design. Um, you know, when you start having the planning discussions about a new feature, a new product, understanding what data is going to be collected. You know, the corollary to what I mentioned earlier that you can't protect what you don't know you have. You don't have to protect data that you don't have. And so, you know, switching from the, you know, I think the traditional engineering mindset of collect all the data because we don't know what we'll need to, you know, how it may be useful in the future, collect only what you know you need and minimize the amount of PII or other sensitive data that you collect. And when you do collect it, you know, be able to explain to your customers why you collect each particular piece of data. And, you know, that helps build trust with your customers, but it's also a good exercise in knowing what you're doing with it and, you know, keeping that inventory. Beyond that, you know, really pri protecting PII is just about having good baseline security practices. You know, PII is not the only sensitive data that a company has. And so whatever security controls you want to have in place to protect that data, it also works for PII. You know, I think that the big thing that we hear as a panacea is encryption of data at rest. And, you know, I don't think that's strictly true um, because you also have to protect the keys. You know, if someone is able to dump the database, but also get at the encryption key, your encryption has done nothing. So, you know, you need, you need to understand throughout the entire life cycle of all the controls that you have, what you're doing and, you know, work through the threat model from the beginning to the end to understand if your controls are actually effective. Yeah, and I think that's a, this is a really good point, not just for Data Privacy Day, but for cybersecurity in general is understanding the intention behind a control um, you know, so encryption is a phenomenal example, right? Encryption at rest has some massive, massive benefits. Um, but like you said, it's, you still have to worry about the keys. And for me, the way I always think about it is that 
using encryption at rest is a really strong way to reduce what you need to worry about, which is now you're the keys. So instead of terabytes and terabytes of information, now I have a smaller data set, which is the keys that I have a little, it's a little easier to wrap your, your head around and, and put stronger policies in place um, because they should be transacted within only a very specific manner. Um, but if you don't understand that and you go like, oh no, we're good because we're encrypted and yet every system has access to the keys, you might as well not be encrypted, which I'm sure I've seen that in my experience. I'm sure given the depth of your experience that you've had a few head scratcher moments um, in that. But uh, so let, let's take this in a, a little bit of a different direction because you mentioned a little bit about trust. And that's a really, that's a topic for another day in, in general. But I think it's a good overarching connection between security and privacy. Um, Simon, I'm gonna throw this back to you for, quite, for a second here is, you know, you're obviously steeped in this, you deal with this all the time, um, you know, from, from a professional angle and, and, you know, and it's your bread and butter. But what do you think from the general public, either from a customer or from the average user, what are they expecting out of privacy? Like when you say data privacy to somebody who's not an expert or not dealing with it all the time, what's their initial reaction or concept of it? I'd say, you know, I'll throw out a few words. Protect, you know, don't abuse. Um, be transparent with how you're using it. Um, those, those come to mind. I think... You know, you mentioned customer trust here. So in, in this digital age, customer trust is critical for winning and sustaining business. Um, I mean, the moment you're in the papers for all the wrong reasons, um, you know, and you don't want to be there, uh, that's when, you know, your customers, um, you know, decide with their feet if they still trust you or not. Um, so I think uh, having... Um, you know, how, how do you get? How do you achieve that customer trust? Well, you know, obviously having a robust privacy program and investing heavily in in the appropriate security controls is is a great way to to go there. And customer trust really can be seen to be, you know, if if you get there, can be seen to be like a competitive differentiator, in my opinion. Okay, and that and that leads me to a little bit of a different angle uh, on the same idea for for Peter. Um, is it, Peter, you said a little bit earlier that, you know, PII is really no different than other sensitive information. It's just a different class, right? So I'm thinking like intellectual property or your source code or, you know, things that a company go like, okay, no, that's important stuff to us. We want to, want to keep it safe. Is that a way to pitch better, you know, besides the, let, let me re, you know, you know, this is live because I'm going to rephrase this on the fly here. Um, Given that we've talked about like the heavy stick coming from GDPR and everybody from a legislative perspective finding that like, that's a good way to encourage behavior for the companies, you know, is the carrot looking at it the way that you proposed, essentially saying you already have these classes of sensitive information that you want to treat very differently. Not everybody internally has access to the financials and um, not everybody has access to HR information. PII is just the same thing, different pile, right? Different categories as to who can interact and who can't. Is that the way forward internally to kind of get the care of like, hey, we're already doing this. It's look at all the benefits of doing it for this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I say that not to minimize, you know, the impact of a, say, a PII breach, um, but just to, you know, sort of emphasize that if you need to protect this data, you can also protect all of your other data at the same time. You don't need to have two separate tracks with two different sets of controls. Um, so, you know, when you're going through all the effort to protect the PII that you have, at the same time, you're also protecting all the other data that you have. And so, you know, from a return on investment perspective, that's, you know, really, I think, helpful in pushing better security. Yeah, and I, I appreciate the clarification. I, and I, I think this is part of the challenge, too, right? It being in the industry and sort of in that, I never took it that way. But I'm glad you, you clarified because maybe some people did. Because I look at it and go like, you don't need a separate firewall for PII, or you need you know anti malware that only protects PII, or you know that kind of stuff. It's just another sensitive data type, and I think that kind of comes for me. One of my frustrations is goes back to an earlier comment of yours, one of one that we will definitely clip and push out on on social, Peter, of that you know you can't protect what you don't know, and I think you know maybe there's an underlying theme here of the lack of information management and classification by companies. Um, and that may be one of the forcing functions from legislation like GDPR is finally clearly defining internally, hey, this database or this table or these fields or these attributes, these are PII, 
as opposed to the broad scope that people usually use internally, right? Of the, yeah, that's a sensitive database. That's not a sensitive database, which may not be granular enough. Simon, does that hold up thinking wise? Nope, oh, you're muted, bud. Schoolboy error. Um, oh, totally. Yeah. Um, look, you know, there is a requirement with the GDPR to maintain what they call a record of processing activity, right? So, um, what is that? Essentially, it's it's a register of, um, you know, uh, I guess all the um, per business purposes that you're using PII, um, and that I think is, if you're looking at the convergence of security and privacy, um, and and the series calls like life's a breach, performing the what they call the ROPA, um, where you're gathering all this information about you know where the PII is, what system it's on what security tech, tech measures are in place, volume of records, uh, what jurisdictions do these individuals reside in across the globe. It's the perfect opportunity to gather that information, take it a little bit further, and actually use that um, to your benefit in the event, or not in the event, like when the break, breach happens. Because you're already one step ahead. You know what's in the system, right? You know about the affected um individuals and you know from a notification perspective which jurisdictions you have to satisfy okay so really important step and it's actually it's actually a mandatory requirement for um for the gdpr so i encourage anybody that hasn't performed that exercise to to adopt that immediately um because i think you can help really build it into your kind of like data breach instance response plan right um we also talk about, you know, where privacy and security sit together. I mean, obviously, I, I virtually sit next to Peter. I'm in the same team as him. So I'm part of the Infosec team, which I think is, is the right place for this type of person. Um, but there is this um, opportunity with the, you know, the, if you're going to develop a, a data breach instant re response plan, is really, you, you're going to be working across the organization. It's not just about Infosec's responsibility. It's about the privacy implications. It's about the communication. So getting your court communications teams involved, getting your legal team involved. If it affects employees, getting your HR team involved, okay? So one, I guess one side effect here and something I would recommend that, uh, that everyone adopt is really running a tabletop exercise around, hey, let's let's focus on an exercise where we, we simulate the worst data breach scenario that could happen and we get everyone around this virtual table and you, you run through the steps required, you record how you deal with it. So you're ready for that moment in the event it happens because you don't want to be ill-prepared when it does happen. That's excellent advice. Um, and so with that, let me throw it back to Peter for a closing comment here. Um, great tip from Simon there as far as, you know, doing the tabletop exercise, making sure you focus on the record of processing. On the engineering and the security side, uh, you know, building out a good security practice, it's, it's a really daunting activity. Um, but if you had to tell people one place to focus in the security side, either controls or process, whatever the case may be, to improve the data protection and data privacy of, of their organization, is there an area that you would say to look at first? Yeah, I mean, I think the technical controls are the given. I, I think the, the piece that people miss is the understanding of your environment. You know, we saw that recently with Log4j as well, where companies were struggling to respond because they didn't know where they used Log4j. And so, you know, focusing on better understanding your environment, the data you collect, you know, that makes the conversations you'll have about risk much more fruitful because you know what actually exists. And then, you know, once you have, you know, better data there, that translates into better discussions with leadership around budgeting and, you know, what are the mitigating controls you're going to put into place? You know, no one technical control is a panacea. You need to have defense in depth. But the, the best way to build that defense in depth is to understand where your risks actually lie and understand your environment, what you're doing, because then you can, you know, put resources in the right places and articulate the, the reasons why you need additional resources or, you know, need to put effort into certain places to reduce your organization's risk. Excellent. Fantastic. And with that, I think we're going to draw this conversation uh, to a close uh, here on Data Privacy Day. Uh, Simon, Peter, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and joining the stream today. Uh, we very much appreciate it. And You're thanks welcome. for having us. Um, and with that, uh, everybody who's tuned in live, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you watching on demand, if you have follow-up questions, 
feel free to leave them as a comment. We're obviously active here on our LinkedIn page. Be sure to follow us at Lacework here on LinkedIn. And we also have a blog post up on lacework.com slash blog. It uh, went live today uh, called Evaluate Your Cybersecurity Posture for Data Privacy Day. Dives a little bit deeper into the connection between uh, security and privacy as it relates to building well in the cloud. Um, we are live streaming every two weeks here with Life's a Breach. Let us know what you'd like to see in the future. If there's someone specific you want uh, to see us have a conversation with, um, this show only gets better the more we interact. With that, we'll see you in the next time.